Hello, everyone. With me today is Dave Churchill, who is the author of Masterbot, the AI developer for Prismata, and is now a professor at Memorial University, where he is continuing to work on AI research. Um, and he has a project that he wants to talk about, some new Prismata-related work. Uh, Dave, welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, so what is it that you guys are working on over there? Um, so right now, I uh, it's not like I saw people in the chat saying this is like AlphaGo or something like that. It's still in the very early stages. Um, it's one master student who is working on doing some machine learning um, with the Prismata uh, underlying AI engine that we wrote a while ago. I see. So um, when you say machine learning. Can you explain what that is for the folks in the chat? Um, and how is it different from the existing Masterbot? Sure, so machine learning is uh, pretty much broken down um, into three main forms of machine learning. So people may have heard of supervised learning or unsupervised learning or reinforcement learning. And so our plan was to kind of do some supervised learning at first where we show the uh, we show the program some states of a Prismata board, and then we try and learn some things from that state. So for example, maybe you're just trying to do something simple. Well, not really simple, but the simplest form of learning might be, OK, just look at this current state of a Prismata game, and then learn which player, um, player one or player two, should probably win from that point forward on the game. I see. Um, so you start out with basic things like being able to predict who can win, but is, is the goal ultimately to use that then to make a bot that can make better decisions in gameplay by sort of choosing the option that gives them the best chance to win? Yeah, so there's a bunch of things we could do actually. So for example, you said what's the difference between um, the machine learning approach and the way the bot works right now. Um, the way the bot works right now is actually using um, a search-based AI, where it sort of, um, as you put it, bifurcates on a bunch of different decisions. Um, so for example, maybe it uh, it can look down the path where it chooses some economic decision or a rushing decision, and then searches over all the possibilities in the next few turns to see which of those is better or not. And the way it tries to figure out which of those is better is by actually determining the state of the game, how good is it for me in a few turns from now. And so if we could use what I just described um, to sort of learn whether or not we'll be in a good state given this is the state of the game a few turns from now. So that's one way we could learn it. Of course, we could also go the, you know, the AlphaGo sort of route where it's all completely self-play reinforcement learning and just sort of pit the bot against itself in a in a death match um, to infinity, and then after a while, it sort of learns what to do. But we're definitely not at that stage yet. But it, it would be sort of an end goal. I see. So, I mean, I know with AlphaGo, they have two separate neural networks. They have the policy network and the value network. And the value network is the thing you're describing, where it's given a Go board, predict who's going to win. And the or and the policy network is more like of the moves I could play right now, which moves are the most promising that I should think about. So I guess the, the approach then is do the sort of uh, evaluation part first and and you could just plug that into the existing Masterbot and already Masterbot would, would possibly be a little bit stronger. But then you could also have a neural approach to candidate move selection, is that the idea? Yeah, so one other thing that we've done so far is um, and I should mention that when you're doing supervised learning, you do need a data set, um, some sort of data that you're learning from. And so um, what we've been learning from so far um, is just the output of the AI itself. So we'll leave the AI to play itself um, a bunch of times over the course of a couple of days, maybe you know, output a million games or something like that, and then look over that data in order to learn something. And the most recent thing we learned is Given the state um, at the start of a turn, what should we buy on that turn? And so far, it's been pretty successful at predicting what the bot would buy, but that doesn't necessarily 
make the bot any stronger. It's just testing the learning capability of the system itself to show us that like the state representation that we're learning or that we're learning from is actually pretty decent. I see. So that's sort of step one. Is is there a, a step two, which is sort of of the form, um, have it come up with novel plans of what to buy or, or something like that? What my initial plan for this was. So right now, um, the search-based AI searches over like four or five different possibilities of what to buy, and so what I wanted to do initially was replace those five possible actions with the learned action and then so the search would have to bifurcate over a, over far fewer things and ideally be able to search deeper into the game and so then we would see whether or not the current AI does better with like as it is right now or with the learned data I see so you actually have a really good way of then of testing whether or not your improvement actually makes a stronger AI which is just playing the old bot against the new bot right yeah, exactly. And and unfortunately, because um, unfortunately we can't use human replays right now because of the intricacies I won't get into. Like the AI engine itself is actually a little different than the in-game engine, and the fact that um, you know there's been a number of balance patches, and each balance patch would kind of have to be learned independently because some minor changes actually make huge differences in build orders and things like this. So it's unfortunate that we can't actually use like Apuchi's build orders uh, to learn from. I see. So um, if you had a bajillion replays, could could it be used to create like an ultimate Prismata AI? Like are human replays, do you think human replays are the key to making something really strong? Or do you think that the AI can get good on its own sort of like Alpha Zero did? Well, I definitely think Alpha Zero is possible. Um, see, here's the thing. Every, people kind of think, oh, Dave is like a professor now. Why doesn't he just like make Alpha Zero? But you have to understand that like, that really hasn't been replicated by anyone outside of DeepMind yet. And they have dozens of people all making like six to times, six to seven times my salary, like constantly working at this thing, which is like really, really polished and really good by a bunch of software engineers. And, and this system so far is by me and a master student, like a single master student that I have. So that's like the caveat up front is like why we don't have Alpha Zero yet. But uh, I, and so that leads into the fact that Prismata is way harder than Go. Like, it's <laughs> the state space and the action space is just, like, way harder. And so you couple those two things with the fact that, like, they had all these TPUs, like, these tensor processing units and stuff, and, like, do not expect me to have, like, Alpha Star or Alpha Zero or anything like that running on Prismata anytime soon. This is all, like, the very first stages of, of doing this sort of thing. Um, I, I see. So I had another question for you, which is um, when you say machine learning, are you always talking about stuff like neural nets or are there other sort of architectures that you consider running? What is the difference between machine learning and neural nets? So, well, I feel like you're interviewing me now because I know you know the, <laughs> the answers to these. So... A neural net is essentially just a black box prediction, like it's a function approximator. So let's say we wanted to do some basic reinforcement learning or supervised learning. Like the most basic form would just be a lookup table, right? Where we have some simple game like tic-tac-toe where we can record all 400 of the states or however many there are. And then for everything, for every state represented by a cell in this table, we just have the optimal action. And so what you quickly realize is that for games like chess or Go or Prismata or StarCraft is that you can't possibly have a table big enough to hold all that stuff. And so what you have to do is find some sort of magic function approximator, which given an input state, um, holds something in you know that virtual cell which is the predicted output. And it turns out that um, GPUs and neural nets work really well together and are sort of the magic glue that holds together like 
all the modern advances in AI. So it's just like a really good function approximator for doing machine learning. Um, that's why it's, you know, these deep neural nets have been so popular recently. I see. Now I know for something like Go, they have a very unique architecture to their neural net that's sort of based on the geometry of the board and stuff like that. Uh, can you do something similar for Prismata? Like, is there a way to set up the neural net so that it will just, you know, be really smart at the game Prismata? Um, I, I think there is, but I, I also don't think it's um, necessary in the same way, because with something like StarCraft and Go, like you said, the geometry of the board matters, but there is no geometry to a a theoretical Prismata board, you know, like units are only in front because you put them there to make it easier to play. But really what you have are a set of unit types with various properties on the board. And so I don't know if there is um, yet a good way to sort of incorporate quote unquote the geometry of a Prismata board. I think just listing the properties um, outright is, is sufficient for what we're doing right now. But it's not to say that there couldn't be one, it's just that you know, we've only been thinking about this for a little while, and uh, I actually posted a bunch of the details, like the actual tech details of our state representation and stuff, on the on the subreddit post, um, sort of looking for um, other people's opinions on whether or not we can make that better. I see. So, how important do you think expert knowledge is in making a good AI for Prismata? Like, do you think being really good at Prismata? is important or do you think it's less important i think that with any sort of retail game ai there, so with modern ai research there really is this magical threshold and that threshold gets crossed at the point where search and or machine learning becomes better than hard coding rules for your game and so if you want to make the quickest, dirtiest, get it done AI um, for a game like StarCraft, you will just hand code a bunch of if then else statements, put a few build orders in, tell it to attack when it has like uh, six units of this type, and then you have an AI, right? And, and it just works. But the problem with that AI is it's, you know, it's, it's rule based and those rules are very easily exploited. And so you don't want to do that if you want to make the best possible AI. But in a game like Go or StarCraft or Prismata, which are very, very difficult to write generalized AIs for, it really does take a, a ridiculous amount of resources, brain power and training data and compute power in order to cross the threshold where your completely learned from scratch AI becomes better than that hard-coded AI. But once it does cross that threshold, then it may just be a matter of time before you can beat the world champion because all you need is a little bit more training. So it's weird. It's like, yes, hard-coded AIs still have a place in a lot of retail games, but it's certainly not going to beat like the world champion. So I see. Yeah, because we often like we often hear from people that either Masterbot makes a mistake or people say, you know, oh, I could improve Masterbot by changing it to do this one thing. Um, but your answer to that is like, you know, you think there's a limit to how good the bot could get. And if you want to excel past that, you need to do something special. You need to do something different than just hard code, more rules. Yeah. Like, so something about master bot right now is that, so people identify mistakes in master bot really easily because it's not a game like Hearthstone where you have a hand of cards. And so one thing, when I went to GDC and saw the talk on the Hearthstone AI, when Hearthstone first came out, they actually stressed how good it was that it was an imperfect information game um, because you can't see that the AI is making a bunch of mistakes because you can't see the cards in its hand. I thought that was really funny. Um, and with Prismata being completely deterministic and, and perfect information, it's really easy to see when the bot makes the mistakes because it can't hide anything. Right? So that actually made it a harder AI to make for a retail game, in my opinion. I see. So, so I guess uh, it's, it's more difficult for, I guess, to hide the mistakes of the bot. And, and so it's, 
I don't know, it's, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, it's more obvious when the bot makes a mistake because you can see it. And therefore, like, people, I guess, have a, an impression of the AI that doesn't reflect how strong the AI actually is relative to other commercial games. Yeah, and, and something else that's interesting about the Prismata AI that probably nobody else but me has thought about because it doesn't matter to anyone else but me is that if you took all the unit properties in Prismata and just randomized them, the bot would still be as good at that game as it is as the current Prismata without any changes to it because it's completely search-based. And so no matter how you balance it or how you tweak it, the bot will pretty much be equally as good as it. And so if you just imagine randomizing all the unit properties in Prismata and then playing against that master bot, like how many games would it take you to be as good as that bot? <laughs> so that's kind of the, the, the strength of the current system is that I never need to run it on a million TPUs for a month to retrain it on a balance patch. And so, yes, it will make mistakes because it doesn't have, you know, human hard-coded knowledge in it, but it will also be completely, like, resilient to... Not completely resilient, but sort of resilient to new balance patches and things like this. I see, and and I suppose that both the the heavily trained bot as well as um, any kind of bot that had a lot of hand hard coded values would not be resilient. Whereas the existing search based bot somehow being in between the middle of those two is resilient against balance changes. That's sort of very interesting. Yeah, it's it's um. One thing when we wrote the paper, I don't know if you read it or not, but of course. It was that the goal of the goal of creating the Prismata AI was not to create the strongest AI, right? Because that is not the goal of a retail game AI. The goal of a retail game AI is to essentially create the most fun experience for players of all skill difficult of all skill levels because you want them to buy your game. And sure, there's a small percentage out there who would love to play against the Alpha Zero of Prismata and it may, you know, also if it existed, make a lot of people better at Prismata, but there is not there's not really a return on your investment of of tens of millions of dollars of research that might go into creating that system. I see, yeah. Because um, the goal in game AI development is just make something fun, of course. Um... Okay, so what, uh, how long is the, the sort of project you're working on right now going to take? Like, is there, do you have a set of goals do you have in mind? Like, when are people going to be able to see the next great uh, version of the Prismata bot? Well, I, you know, to be completely honest, I can't even say whether or not the thing we made will ever make it into the system. Because if we end up with, like, a gigabyte neural net model um, <laughs> that could barely fit into our 1080 Ti GPUs, how are people going to run that model like when they play against the AI, right? We can't promise that anything we're doing in research will actually immediately make it into the bot. And um, I guess you, can all, you also can't even promise that it will be better than what's out there right now. Right, and, and the thing is, with a game like Prismata, the, the thing that makes it difficult, one of the things that makes it difficult is the huge space of actions that you can possibly take. Like right now, you just had about 20 different units to click on. And what is the like number of subsets of units that you could have clicked on? And that's like really hard to search over because it's a really big number. It's way bigger than Go. It's not quite as big as StarCraft, but actually it is almost as big as, as Alpha Star's action space because they limited it to it actually clicking on the screen. So like it's, it's pretty damn difficult. I see. So what you're saying is it's challenging, but we should be cautiously optimistic that maybe you'll you'll uh well, maybe there will be some advancement of the state of the art. So yeah, it's almost like in in academic AI research, if something has been done with like rule-based systems in the past and you create something that's even marginally better than that using some sort of generalized AI, whether it's search or learning, then that is a publishable result, right? You don't need to have something like DeepMind where they will only release a, re a result if it's the best in the world. 
<laughs> I see. So, I, I mean, I guess your, like, when you do research with a master's student, your goal is to advance the state of the art in sort of academic research. And, and you think of Prismata as like a good test bed for academic research because it's sort of a, it's a very different problem than chess and go in terms of how the actions are selected and, and stuff like that. So, so I, I like, um, is there a reason why Prismata is sort of a special game in the game AI community that makes it different from Starcraft and go and these other games? Yeah, it's, um, it's actually really good as a research test bed because it's more complex than Go. It has a, a way bigger state space, a way bigger action space. Um, but it doesn't have some of the annoying things that you have to deal with when it comes to StarCraft, like unit pathfinding and all the other bullshit that comes with Brewbor that I'm sure you're um, really familiar with, like dragoons running into themselves and unit attacks canceling for reasons that you don't know. Um, and there's no geometry, which makes learning representations easier. And so it's this really neat middle ground between um, between something like a traditional board game and StarCraft, where like dexterity is really, really important. I see. Um, now, if if StarCraft, can you compare StarCraft to a game like with a lot of randomness, like or even hidden information, like Hearthstone? Is there a big difference in how you would approach the AI for a deterministic, perfect information game versus a game with randomness or hidden information? Are you talking like approach? You mean like if I had infinite resources to create the best thing, or like a retail game AI? Uh, well, I guess the 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 academic AI was sort of the the direction that I originally had in mind for that question, but uh, I, I guess you could answer both. Both seem like interesting questions. So, and it was between what two types of games again? Well, just just a, a more randomized game like Hearthstone, or some game with randomness and or hidden information versus uh, uh, like a perfect information game like Prismata. Is there a big difference in how you approach the AI? Yeah, so one of the things about search-based AIs, um, like if you're using something like Monte Carlo Tree Search or Alpha Beta Search, is that the structure of those algorithms and data structures really changes a lot based on whether the game is perfect information or not. Um, because if you think about it, well, it just does. I'm not going to get into the, the nitty-gritty specifics of that. But if you look at something like um, reinforcement learning, for example, where you are taking a given state and an action and a reward from the environment and then learning what to do based on that, it actually doesn't matter whether or not the underlying environment is perfect information or deterministic or whatever. It's just learning over time, this was the best thing to do when I saw this information. So that's actually one of the really big... Um, the really big uh, advantages of doing something like reinforcement learning is that it you don't need to know what the underlying model is. You just kind of let it learn. So I hope that answers it a bit. It's like, based on the properties of it, you would choose an algorithm. Um, but also based on your end goal, like whether it's to make the best possible thing or something that's sort of good enough for a retail game, that's, that also factors into it. I see, that's fascinating. So, um, let's see. Does the chat have any questions for Dave? Because I think I've just about ran out of things to ask. Or Dave, if there's anything else you'd like to add or anything you'd like to talk about. Are you looking for more students? Um, always looking for good students, not necessarily more students. Um, I've got five students right now. And oh, that's one lot. of them is working on Prismata. Yeah, um, it's pretty fun though. Uh, one of them is we've got someone working on robotics, um, someone working on StarCraft, someone working on Atari games. Um, so lots of different game AI. Um, your chat is amazing at asking questions. <laughs> They're asking you integrals and what kind of ice cream you like. Yeah, I got it open here. Um, I don't know any math, um, so I will skip the integrals. And, uh, oh, look, an actual question. Oh, one thing I did want to say is 
if anyone actually knows anything about machine learning or state representation or action representation or neural nits inputs and outputs, please go read the post on the Prismata subreddit because we have a limited amount of brain power thinking about this problem. And if I could get some more brains in on that and they can help solve some of our problems, I would happily put their name on one of our publications. Well, that's very interesting. So you're looking for- When I for... said I don't know math, uh, so yeah, that's an actual question. ML professor that doesn't know math. I'm actually not specialized in machine learning. Um, my specialty is in search. And when I say I don't know math, I mean I don't know calculus. I'm very, very bad at calculus and I am glad that things like TensorFlow exist because programming, backpropagation, um, and uh, gradient descent, I really hate it. <laughs> but you've done it before. Of course, you know, you have to implement your own neural net at one point. I see. So guy, guy who doesn't know math, like implemented some stuff based on very advanced calculus. So you, you need to know some math at some point. The thing is, I, I will look at an equation and my head will spin sometimes, but then I actually spend some time and break it down into an implementable algorithm. And it's only at the point where I have implemented it that I actually understand it. Mm, I, I like see. think in code. I don't think in equations. So both of us are very different in that respect. Well, but but so far it looks off like you're off to a great start as a, as a career doing real research in machine learning. So that's proof you don't need to be good at math at all. Well, that's the thing. It's kind of like that. There's that meme, right, where it's like, hey, oh, what was it again? It's like if you're a software engineer and you just sit there all day tweaking random characters on the screen until something works, you're considered a failure and you'll be fired. But if you do that and call yourself a machine learning expert, you'll get paid three times your normal salary. <laughs> uh, I certainly hope it's not just tweaking random characters. But the thing is, like, you know, for, for the vast majority of, of machine learning in industry right now, you're plugging in input and output data into TensorFlow and turning some knobs and at the end of the day, whoever's knobs are the best, like that's the guy you hire. It's machine learning as a service these days. There's very few people who actually contribute to the underlying algorithms of, of neural nets or machine learning. They're just, they're net builders. They just like program the layers because some Indian guy on YouTube told him that was how to put together the neural net. <laughs> I, I see you. You sort of sound like you have a, a, a pejorative attitude towards these commercial machine learning applications. Well, it's great because it brings machine learning to the masses, but it's like that every it's like saying that there's a lot of operating systems experts because everybody uses Windows. I mean, mm, I see. It's great. I, I love it because I get to tell a student, hey, go use TensorFlow and Keras to learn this stuff. Um, but like, and I do know the math that makes it tick, but, you know, there was a hundred people at Google that made TensorFlow. And so in the span of one master's student's like career of two to three years, how are they going to implement anything that comes even close in terms of the numerical stability and underlying calculus and stuff that goes into those algorithms? And so... It's very difficult for a master's student to actually contribute to the algorithmic side of machine learning. And what a lot of people, unfortunately, are doing now, I'm, I'm trying to avoid this, is that there's this big machine learning hammer, and they're looking for nails, and then they publish something, hey, look at the nails that I was able to beat with this hammer, rather than the more traditional form of research, which is, hey, I created a new hammer, um, people with nails should look at this. I see. Um, well, that's very interesting. Are there any other questions for the chat? I saw one. Just one second. I'll read one here. So uh, S. Fain says, is it correct to assume that the new bot has more possibility to find new good line strats players never use compared to the current master bot? So, yeah, there's... There's actually like a very limited amount of things that the current master bot can do. So at any given time, uh, some people say, for example, why don't you just put in like a one minute time limit for the current master bot? 
And the thing is, the way the current master bot is programmed is that it will only ever search deeper. It will never search wider. And so it currently only looks over about, on average, between 20 and 40 possible things. And those things are created from things like try to buy the most attack this turn, or try and buy the most economy this turn, or try and buy the most defense this turn, or breach the economy, or breach their attacking and stuff. And so that makes it sort of, you know, quote unquote, good enough for a retail game AI. But if you give it more time, it's just going to look over those same things for more turns into the future. It's not actually going to find new lines, if you, even if you gave it an hour per turn. And so anything learned would be able to definitely find new lines that the current one doesn't look over. That's because the, the design of the current one is really restricted. And so if we were going down that route, if someone can solve the problems that I posed on Reddit, then it would definitely, I think, has the definite possibility to be stronger than the current bot. But I don't know if we will get there in the in the actual time limit that we have for this project, which is maybe another eight months. I see. So I, I know that, like, when they started doing backgammon AIs, they discovered new openings that the humans hadn't really thought were good and that they turned out to be good. And then the humans started using them. And I think in Go, the same thing has happened now with AlphaGo. So is it possible that a really good Prismata bot could discover some new opening lines that the humans would then actually start incorporating? Oh, definitely. Um, I think this may even be happening, and you could actually probably answer this way better than me, but did you watch the new Alpha Star matches? Uh, I did. I, I watched, well, I watched the five that they broadcast. I didn't watch the other ones, or the six that they broadcasted. Um, yeah, so there's that thing where they think now that players are going to be like oversaturating their minerals more because that's a thing that humans don't do, but Alpha Star really did well. And so like that might just happen in in StarCraft already, which is pretty amazing. And I noticed that when I was doing um some search algorithms for micromanagement, I in a couple of experiments where I was doing like 3 versus 3 micro experiments, I thought that the AI was producing really stupid moves. But it turned out that it was just like playing 4D chess and was way beyond me. And they were actually really smart moves about how it was like learn to bait the the scripted in-game AI and stuff like that. So yeah, definitely. I mean, if it if I had DeepMind's resources, it would find things that humans had not found yet. But you know, whether or not I'm going to find that um, with my current electrical budget. <laughs> Uh, well, I think there was somebody in the chat that said if you need some compute, they might be able to help. I don't, I don't know who that was. Um, is yeah, it... right now it's not necessarily compute being the answer because I th think there's like this. Also, even if we had perfect state representations, like for example, the Alpha Star team had 39 people on it. Those 39 people, all working for DeepMind, let's say they they were getting a relatively low conservative salary of $200,000 per year. That's <laughs> $8 million per year in salary, okay? That just the team. Then the hardware and the, like we're talking literally tens of millions of dollars devoted to that project. And so it's not just the hardware. It's it's the people and like this is one master student's project that I am in like a very limited amount of my time helping him with. So we'll see how far we get, but it's definitely not just I have some GPUs. Like we have, we have 10 GPUs that we could run this stuff on, but the problem is coming up with the representation that you're sure will work before you actually throw it onto that hardware. I see. Um, well, I don't think I had any other questions. Oh, one, one question is... Um, could uh, an AI ever get so good that it, it discovers like a completely winning strategy with a certain set of units or, or like an unbeatable strategy? Maybe not a provably unbeatable one, but just sort of a, a practically unbeatable strategy. Like could the AI discover auto wins with certain combinations of units or anything like that? Yeah, so I think that this is... So when when I talk to companies about AI researching games, one of the things that they have said to me is that even if you had like a really good search algorithm and if or a really good um, like learning algorithm or whatever, even if you could produce a really good AI, 
we don't have the like spare cycles in the game, right? And, or we're afraid of of it being too good or something like this. And I say to them, one one thing that people don't often think of when they think of game AI is the offline game design capabilities of a good AI. You don't have to run a good AI online always against your players. You can use it for things like balance testing. Um, like I remember I wrote a puzzle solver for you, right? Yes, and, and we used one it. Of, one of the puzzles, like you, you change a unit, you hit a button, and it gives you the optimal line for that puzzle. And I think that those sorts of things, I think one of them even maybe was something you didn't see, but I don't know. I can't really claim that. Um, but I think that those sort of, you know, let this not necessarily brute force, but a lot of compute AI run offline to find balance problems is is the future of of QA in games. Like, why would you pay a hundred people to sit there and try and clip out of bounds with Mario when you could have one computer doing that all the time? Mm, I see. That's very fascinating. So you, you could sort of have an AI that's rewarded if it discovers bugs and try to or, or, or exploits or auto wins or or uh, alternate solutions to puzzles. I mean, I just remember designing puzzles with your puzzle solver AI. And I mean, it, there were limitations to what it could do. It couldn't do the biggest and scariest puzzles. But for the smaller puzzles, like just having an oracle that I could query that says, is there a solution? Is there a unique solution, at least for the first three or four turns, um, was incredibly helpful. Um, but I also worry that it, it leads... Uh, as a puzzle designer, I worry that it leads me to design puzzles that are less about the player having a really good insight and more about just kind of searching for the one right answer. So, um, but it's definitely an interesting tool. Yeah, and a, a colleague of mine, Nathan Sturdivant, has actually done research and written papers in this area of creating puzzles and solving those puzzles. And so he's done things like, um, I may be slightly off um, on exactly what he's done, but things like designing puddle puzzles for Sudoku-like games in which, like, he'll detect, he'll get solutions, maybe the optimal solution, or, or I think he, no, sorry, one second. So he wants to find puzzles that are interesting that have unique solutions. But unique solutions, not necessarily in terms of the action path, but maybe... that have unique properties to them that other solutions don't. And so he has some way of evaluating those type of things, um, not just in terms of the path length, but in terms of other properties, like maybe, you know, you could have bifurcated earlier on, which makes it more interesting to users and things like this. Mm, I see. Yeah, I think we are really just beginning to get started. Like, it, like honestly, if I was ever to do a PhD in research, I would be very interested in computer-assisted tools for puzzle design that make puzzles that humans enjoy solving. Because I think, like, there's been a lot of research done on making computer-created puzzles that have a certain difficulty level or, or just creating a lot of content really quickly. But I think, like, a lot of people complain that sort of computer-created Sudokus are boring or computer-created Slitherlinks are, are boring. And I think there's probably a lot of room to improve on those algorithms by making not just you know just just puzzles but aesthetically pleasing puzzles and puzzles that contain deep and interesting insights you know that that would be a fun area of research yeah there's um just people doing all sorts of things like this like ai's that cooperate with humans um ai's that behave like humans like that that experiment that i did where where uh, masterbot played on the ladder i thought that was really Cool, how nobody ever sent a message to the bot or thought it was a bot or anything like that. <laughs> and that uh. was because I put random click delays in. in <laughs> and what's crazy is this, is that people will play against MasterBot. Like, you've looked at the logs. I've, you've, I've looked at the logs. There are people out there who play tens of thousands of games against MasterBot. And yes, there are some things that are hard-coded in MasterBot that it, like, you can, you can opponent model. And there were people who could crush MasterBot when they knew they were playing against it, who lost to it during that experiment when they didn't know that they were playing against it. Because they didn't go down that one line on turn three that they know MasterBot loses and, and so to, yeah. It, yeah, so it's, it's really funny like how 
you you get so like I could play against the League of Legends easy bots and get like ten kills before they even got to lane because I've played against them so many times, right? And you know their little weaknesses are like they turn left here, and it's just really funny that people say, "Oh, Masterbot sucks." Yeah, but you lost to it when you didn't know it was a bot because you had to play standard. Yeah, and and uh, Pump is asking in the chat. Yeah, we actually did. Like we have the calculated elo of that bot test that we ran on the ladder as well as the calculated elo of masterbot for sure and i think there was a big difference like it was probably more than 100 points so pump is asking if i actually have statistics on that um i do not and it was a long time ago and um well how do you remember so there's what a lot of tier... hand waving here but i do know that there was one person who lost to the bot twice on the ladder who had posted like about the strength of the bot on Reddit. Do you um? Do you remember how how high it got? Like what tier it got? It was like the top tier that wasn't Elo. So it was it, it got to tier nine. Yeah, at the time. But at the time, the rank that it got to, if I remember correctly, was in the top fifteen percent of human players that had played like, more than one game on the ladder. Yeah, I, I think that was also written about in the paper. Or, or yeah, one the of details the, are there, the so papers. I don't want to rely yeah. on my memory for that. Oh, there's a couple of actual questions. Let me let me read those. Who's this SSP that people keep talking about? Uh, he's a member of our community. He, I, I think uh, he posts a lot of Prismata unit designs, but I think... Uh, I, I don't know uh, anything that much about him, really. S. Fain asks, is there a reason or some sort of incompatibility in the current Masterbot's code that makes it particularly bad at using mobile Animus? I think there actually might be. Um, because one of the way that Masterbot decides to purchase units if it goes aggressive is a, a greedy knapsack solver that tries to buy as much attack as possible on a given turn and it was actually including mobile animus in that. Is mobile animus the one that produces an attack? Yeah, yeah. so you can click it to sacrifice it to get a rhino, and I think the bot clicks it too much, and I think that's why. Yeah, and so there were some units that are just so hard to come up with, like, a little rule base -y thing in order to, like... Because Masterbot doesn't do all search. There are some things that it's like, okay... If it's going to breach, sacrifice this or something like that. And I think that there were some units, like this is how bad Masterbot is underneath that people don't even know, is that there were some units that I that it was so bad with that I just put them into a set of units that Masterbot will never buy. <laughs> yep. I I know that set of units it's sitting in the config file. I, I have added a unit to it maybe. I don't know. Yeah, there's there's a few of them. Like, I think Zamora is just, like, hopelessly long-term or savior or something like that. So, yeah, you could you could definitely easily add a rule that it just never clicks it um, or never buys it. Like, that's that's the, another good thing about the bot is that if you just had a completely machine-learned bot... So, we were at GDC one year, and there was someone talking about a game in which they had a machine-learned AI for this, like, top-down shooter-type game. And it was really strong. But what happened was the AI was doing things like really exploiting the geometry of a level to like sort of abuse the players where it would throw a grenade and it would bounce off like three walls and land in the perfect pixel. And so the designers went to the AI person and were like, hey, can you make it not do that thing specifically? And he was like, no. Because <laughs> <laughs> it's a neural, it's a neural bot. And so one of the things that um, maybe you can, I'd like to ask you a question, which is sort of what things have you done with like the AI config? Because it was sort of designed for designers, right? Not yeah. necessarily an AI person. Well, uh, we didn't do that much, honestly, because the default settings you had in there were quite good. Um we have limited the amount that it can buy certain units that it would tend to overbuy just by putting a cap on them. Um, we've added more openings to the opening book, especially with some of the econ units. Um, 
we have two sets of opening books now. One is sort of the degenerate rushes, which are not used by Masterbot, and the other is sort of a more reasonable set of openings. Um, and actually, there's a third set, which is just the basic econ openings, like, you know, go third NG sometimes. Um, and like, for example, when we made a new wild drone, we had to update those openings because the old wild drone openings obviously weren't going to work anymore. So um, it, but and that's the one thing I was saying about having to maintain this sort of constantly updated list of hard coded openings, right? It's difficult. Yeah, but it's it's sort of like it's it's not really an amount of toil that I consider problematic. Like we adjust units every couple of months and I maybe have to spend a half hour or an hour with the AI configuration file every time. It's really, it's not so burdensome that, you know, we'd want to invest in a different AI architecture in order to avoid that drawback. Like it's a, it's a very minimal drawback, but um, I don't so know, I, I like- said, Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I just said I like the config file and the way it works. It's very convenient for us as working with it as developers. And uh, Pumph just said something, you know, he said, oh, it's hard-coded to get maximum attack this turn, etc. cetera. And um, so people, especially in the beginning, were posting their, like, theories about the, like, what the AI was doing under the hood and, like, what the algorithms must have been. And it's so funny how wrong people were. Like, <laughs> yeah. And that's not in a I'm right, you're wrong sort of way. It was just in, in what they thought was going on for the AI to make such a decision wasn't even in the same universe as, as like what the code was doing. And I thought it was really funny because sometimes people were like, oh my God, it's so smart. It did this thing and it was completely like hard coded or the bot was like so bad in this situation and it turned out to be like something that's really easy for the human to like rationalize about that's actually takes like three turn look ahead which is the bot is kind of bad at. yeah um people asking if they could contribute opening books like the problem with opening books is that well we can't just like list a bunch of candidate openings and have the bot sort of search over them what it ends up doing is um like i think one issue with the bot was that when it bifurcates between different options like within one opening book an opening book always just tells it what to do and it's sort of a prioritized a prioritized list of things so if we want to have a bunch of different openings and then have the bot select between them we actually had to like make a bunch of different prioritized list of things and have it bifurcate between them so we sort of ended up doing quite a few hacks in order to build um some of the bots for the casual match bot ladder um like the the rushy bots or stuff like that um it's very hard to add more openings to that list without making the bot sort of like because we don't want it to bifurcate between a hundred different possibilities because it literally like wouldn't run in time or it wouldn't be able to run very deeply um but at the same time, like we build these opening lists and not all openings are available every game because some of them are dependent upon the existence of a random set unit, which isn't always there. So, yeah, yeah I think if we had to do it over, we could definitely find a different architecture for writing opening books and randomly selecting one or, or selecting a few and then bifurcating on them or something like that. But it's sort of... Um, it's definitely good enough. Like we were able to make those 30 bot personalities and people love playing against them and they really know like what bot likes to do what type of behavior. Yeah, and people are always saying, oh, I could write like a scripted bot that plays, you know, base set and destroys the bot. I'm sure you could. It probably would not be difficult. Um, but that bot would not do very well as soon as you get like, 20 units in a set or the mid game of a random base set plus 10 and so it's it's a little bit more difficult and and something that people don't realize is like you know small indie game memes aside the bot kind of accomplished its task like the original task was to have it beat Shalev after he skipped his first turn <laughs> yeah right and and uh it's way better than that it's, uh, no, I'm so happy with how good the bot is. Like, honestly, the reputation online from a lot of new players that play the game is the bots are fucking insane. They're impossible. Like, new players think that the bot is incredibly good. It's only once you've been playing for, like, I don't know, 100 hours that you can really comfortably beat Masterbot. It, it actually 
takes a long time. There um, was one streamer I remember <laughs> who was, you know, sometimes you see a new streamer pop up playing Prismata, and he was playing against the bot, and he was, like, swearing at it because it was cheating. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, this is not how that works. <laughs> Oh, he, I mean, in RTS, the bots always cheat, right? Like, they mine four minerals and then take home five or something like that. Like, the yeah, Command and Conquer like, AIs or whatever. How would it be? Like, just list a way in which you think it could cheat. Oh. <laughs> uh, Jeez. Like, maybe he thought it was getting units for lower prices or something like that. How come the bot always has exactly one defense more than your attack? <laughs> That's actually really interesting. So... Like, that was initially hard-coded in the bot, and then eventually turned in... Like, there's a brute force search. So one of the action things that the bot searches over for defense is, like, it takes the unit costs of all your units and then finds the sequence of defensive actions that leaves you with the highest sum of remaining cost. Yes, the greedy knapsack approach. Yeah, no, this is actually not knapsack. It's greedy knapsack for buying, but is a legit solver for defense. And the solver runs for like a thousand iterations, and if it doesn't, then it takes the best one so far. So it can't break on large states, but it legit solves like 99.9% .9 of things with that evaluation. And so the tricky thing there was then like factoring in things like stamina. Like how, like, I think what the bot does is it's like, if something is like a defender only, like a, force field and it has one health instead of two it's worth like half minus epsilon of the first one or if it's has no charges left then it like divides it by like its initial charges it's like crazy but that's essentially what the bot does on defense and for a lot of things it works pretty well yeah Ugh. i i remember when shalev implemented the first version of the you know the the old version that was actually written in action script um and we were trying to think about defense and and we were trying to think whether it was feasible to actually just like solve this knapsack problem by doing sort of a an integer dynamic programming type of approach and we concluded that like maybe we could but the amount of special cases and sort of extra stuff that we'd have to code in code in are just insane and even now with q defense like people want q defense to be perfect and making a perfect q defense is actually a hard task it's oh, really definitely. hard and something i have been telling you guys is that you could easily make uh the q defense just be what the bot does but i'm sure that your q defense is probably better than the bot at this point well i think it like yeah i think at this point well it's it's hard to say um i think there are pros and cons to both approaches but like we really want q defense to run in a frame right like we so don't to yeah to answer w garrison um the master bot does not do q defense it doesn't even know that it exists um so literally the way that masterbot defends is it has um, values assigned to every resource type in the game and then it will sum the resources of every unit that it has. It will go through every possible sequence of blocking units like with transpositions taken out and stuff. And then the resulting evaluation, like the difference between the starting and the ending of defense it will minimize the loss of those resources. And yeah. the problems come in where... Um, the value of a unit is not counts. commensurate with its cost. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what we have in Q defense, like we have an override, and it's probably like half the units in the game or a third of the defenders in the game. Um, sorry, a third of the units, half the defenders, have some kind of override on their value where we say, no, nah, actually, the value of this unit is not the sum of its cost. It turns out that you need to calculate it as this. Um, but So what I just described when I said that's how it does defense, that's actually not true. That's one of the three ways it does defense. Um, so it bifurcates on doing that, um, defending to save the most possible attackers and defending to save the most possible economy. I'm going to see if I can pull open the the one that we have um, that just evaluates. Like, there's there's literally a function called value of unit. Um, and it, 
there's one that it uses for breaching and there's one that it uses for defense and they're slightly different but like you know i like that table you have oh my god i thought mine was bad <laughs> Well, we've we've had to add to this, and also there's there's a bunch of special cases for campaign and and stuff like that. Um, you should open up the AI config and show people what that mess looks like. Oh, sure. Um. <laughs> anyway, maybe you don't want to give away the the secrets. Oh, of, I, uh, I I I don't mind what it does or doesn't do. Uh, I'm just trying to remember which is the correct one, like. It, it's it's not really that human readable, but like these are, um, those are the opening books though. This like is the actual AI thing is like maybe thirty lines. Yeah, so this is like the blue turn two bot has certain openings that it does. The conduit one, um, these are like some econ openings. Uh, this is like what the fastimus bot does. Uh, Dave Churchill, how does it feel to be talking to someone who is such an awful programmer? <laughs> oh. um, I remember, if I can tell one story from the early days of Prismata development, which was like, you know, way before Steam or Public Launch or anything like that, where Elliot said to me, Dave, the server code is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> this was like in 2015, 14, something like that. Yeah, well, I think I think what happened is um, it, it was sort of an inside joke at the company that when Will and Alex uh, and I were working on the code, like I worked primarily on the server code and Will worked primarily on the client code. And there would sometimes be a bug and we never knew whether it was the client that, that was buggy or the server that was buggy and we'd go and check it out and i think for like five times in a row it was like the server was fine and the client was buggy and then so will had this joke that like oh the server's always perfect right and it was actually very rare that we found issues in the server now we do know of some like I this love was how you spun this into it was a joke well this is this was before we had I don't know, like before we were trying to deal with like lag and reconnects and and actually running the server on Amazon. You know, this is just sort of when we're building a, a like a back end game side to manage sort of the game state and where all the players were and stuff like that. And like it's very simple because the server in Prismata doesn't keep track of nearly as much game state as the client does. Right. The server basically just like you know, gets the moves, writes them down for replays, sends them to both players, and makes sure that certain stuff is verified. Um, so it, it was just less complex, and so there weren't generally gameplay bugs on the server. And I think, you know, it's it's still true that for years there haven't been gameplay, like, bugs related to the state of a game being messed up on the server. And I think you and I were having a conversation in the context of stuff related to the AI and the game state. I think it was, um, we were talking about load balancing, but that's mm. neither here nor there. And I remember my someone else, like just, just from that guy's quote about um, how good a programmer you are. My fa I think my favorite quote from the early days was me suggesting that we write some unit tests. And you said, no, we'll write the test once everything is working. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think uh, there was Indie a game dev is great. Yeah, G game dev is like a. It's notorious as. How do I say this nicely? Game developers almost never write tests because a lot of their code is sort of shipped and then thrown away. So I think game development makes underuse of unit tests and and sort of you know nightly tests and stuff like that compared to other aspects of software engineering but i think they are mostly correct in their decision to do so and we have um we do have a set of tests for the game state and we have a set of tests for certain you know pure function things running on the server like things that calculate elos after a game or, or something like that we do have tests for that but by and large um things like ui like we actually looked into tools to test ui and we had a person who was writing 
tests for the server that would just like you know every night we could run a test that like makes a new account logs in does some shit whatever automatically and make sure that everything worked and produced the right output and we discovered that those tests were so difficult to maintain because we were constantly updating the protocols and changing the way the client and the server interacted and and every time a test failed it was because we had changed something rather than because there was a bug and so like those tests actually ended up being of negative value because they would lead us to chase wild geese all the time instead of actually finding problems with our software so yeah it's it's like i don't know I think it's that so writing, different writing good tests is also like an art form in itself right yes yes it, but it's very different than writing any kind of enterprise software um and the thing that matters so much is the hours of your life because you you know you want to finish the game and get it shipped so a lot of corners that get cut that would never get cut if you were working for microsoft or google Anyways, we're way off topic now. Um, I did want to thank you, Dave, for joining us and for answering the questions. Um, Dave is a fucking superstar. He's a prof at Memorial University working in AI, and he is the author of Masterbot and is doing a lot of interesting and cool AI stuff. Uh, Dave, anything you'd like to add? Um, just so the people who, when you announced that I was making AlphaGo, said they were really hyped about it, please don't uh, get superhuman expectations. This is all research stuff, and I hope it ends up in the bot. And if anyone wants to, um, like, if anyone says, hey, I'm going to finish up my degree and would like to do a master's or a PhD in Prismata AI and doesn't mind moving to Newfoundland, let me know. Um, Google Dave Churchill Memorial, and I'll probably pop up. All right. Thanks, Dave, for joining us. We'll speak with you again soon. Take care. Oh, and uh, strawberry ice cream. <laughs>